Hey everybody, this is uh, Dalton and Jack from uh, Analyze and Optimize, and we are here to answer your questions today. First time ever doing this. Uh, a lot of big fans of the uh, of the videos and of the of the Twitter and such submitted their questions, so we're we, we're happy to uh, involve the community, and hopefully we can do some more stuff like this uh, in the future. So we got about thirty questions. Uh, hopefully, this doesn't take all of eternity to answer all of them. So. Try not to go into too many tangents, but yeah. Yep, and we're both analyze and optimize. There's the two of us. Um, I I would say I'm analyze, and Dalton over here is optimize. I'm clearly analyze, but well, Dalton does a lot of the science, so he'll be answering most of the questions. Um, I do more of the history <laughs> and the scripts of the videos, um, so I'll answer whatever questions I can, and I guess we'll go from there. All right, we ready to ready to get going? Yep. All right. So first question comes from uh, <laughs> comes from our guy Fruit Juice. Uh, shout out to Fruit Juice. He's an avid watcher of the videos. Uh, also decided to make a YouTube poop of us, which was pretty hilarious. <laughs> so Fruit Juice's question is: How do you diagnose and fix gut dysbiosis? Uh, so I mean. Look, I think um, the microbiome is not very well understood. And, you know, I think we know that there are some microbes that are, you know, overtly bad, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, and those you can get tested for with things like parasitology. You know, you can check for yeast overgrowth uh, and things like that. Um, the validity of those tests is always in question, depends where you get it from and such. But, you know, I would really just look for symptoms really and you know since the gut is so central to everything it could be a lot of different symptoms but uh most of the serotonin 90 percent of your serotonin is produced in the gut from bacteria so if you're having high serotonin symptoms you know obviously we did a whole video on that uh, i would try to look into that you know if you have high serotonin symptoms that might be a pretty good indicator that you might have uh, bacterial overgrowth or dysbiosis um, and then of course just any type of gut issues you know if you have diarrhea constipation anything like that, uh, you can pretty much bet that serotonin and estrogen and uh, a disordered microbiome is going to play a, a pretty big role. So I would look for the symptoms first. And then, you know, if you want to confirm that with the test, then go ahead. Uh, but a lot of the things you can do to sort of, uh, I don't want to say optimize, <laughs> analyze, <laughs> no, not even, uh, but to modulate the, <laughs> the gut microbiome, um, you know, are pretty simple. You don't have to jump into antibiotics or, you know, prescription antifungals or anything uh, right off the bat. So there's a lot of things that you could do, uh, you know, mushrooms, carrot salad, things like that. Uh, other types of fibers, flowers of sulfur is a really uh, safe, benign way of eliminating fungus. So there's there's a lot of things that you could play with to, to sort of see if you have a response and that can give you a pretty good indicator. So hopefully answered that pretty well. All right, moving on. Uh, this one, uh, again, a YouTube comment. This is from Sixers minus 27.72. Um, it's a pretty strange name, but he's got a dragon, so that looks cool. <laughs> Do you recommend keto if you are insulin resistant, even if it causes lower thyroid? Is there a way to maintain thyroid on keto? Um, so this is two separate questions, obviously. So the first part, do I recommend keto if uh, if you're insulin resistant, even if it causes lower thyroid. Um, I think it really depends on the severity of your metabolic mayhem. You know, if you're like morbidly obese and your fasting blood sugar is like 250 and you're just, you know, eating anything in general is dangerous at that point. So I think at that point, you know, things like, you know, severe carbohydrate restriction and extended fasting do have significant benefits because you're just in like a dangerous state and it's even more dangerous to be consuming carbohydrate at that point. So yeah, I think in that situation you would, but um, you know, I don't think there's a ton, a ton of people that are in that situation. So I think if you are moderately insulin resistant, you know, maybe you have triglycerides that are in the one to 200 range or, you know, your fasting blood glucose is, you know, maybe a hundred or so or a little bit higher. Those are pretty good indicators that, you know, you're not optimally 
uh, insulin sensitive. And I don't think that you need to go on keto. And I, in fact, I wouldn't uh, at that point. I think you would try to do it uh, with carbohydrates at that point. There's a lot of things that you could do from there. Is there a way to maintain thyroid on keto? I mean, there is a way to maintain it, but you will not be able to optimize it, I don't think, uh, without carbohydrates in the diet. Uh, eating more fat would be your best bet. Um, trying not to like overdo the protein in terms of the ratio between that and the fat, uh, especially saturated fat, definitely not polyunsaturated fat. Um, so yeah, those would be your best bets, but overall, I don't think it's optimal for the, uh, for the thyroid, but there are ways that you can at least manipulate it, uh, to make it more favorable to not completely tank your thyroid. And one of the other things would be to not do a bunch of extended fasts and shit of that nature <laughs> so hopefully uh hopefully that answers that well enough yeah but i, I uh, would just say i mean being obese is probably like worse than <laughs> being a, on keto and i mean it does work like if you're fasting and you're doing keto you are going to lose weight but there are going to be some negative side effects um so i'll just throw that in and yeah then our, definitely and then our next question is uh what's the best way to supplement d3 topical versus oral should it be ingested alongside other subs to prevent side effects etc from novi pp pp <laughs> yeah um so pp uh what i would say is the best way to supplement uh i think um i think oral i believe affects the blood levels more favorably uh but it really depends like if you can't get or can't afford uh, a higher quality D3 supplement, especially like a lot of them have freaking soybean oil and a bunch of other garbage additives in them, you know? So if you find that you're taking oral and it's not working for you, you know, it's probably not the vitamin D. It's pro it probably is those other things. But on the flip side of that, it kind of leads into the second part of this question. Other supplements to take uh, alongside it, you know, magnesium is going to be crucial. I like magnesium glycinate. Uh, less less risk of getting like diarrhea or the shits or something um and it's better absorbed so i would definitely recommend trying to up the magnesium calcium is also going to be extremely important there because vitamin d and calcium uh, work together in a bunch of different ways and same goes for vitamin k2 so uh but k2 is really the only one there or i guess with magnesium as well k2 and magnesium are nutrients that are hard to get enough from even if you're eating a, a really good diet uh, whereas calcium, you know, if you're drinking milk and you're eating cheese and whatnot, that's obviously not super concerning. Uh, but yeah, I would just make sure to get the calcium, the magnesium and the K2. Those would be the biggest, those would be the biggest cofactors that you would want with, with, uh, with D3. So topical versus oral, it's really, I think oral would be better, but if you can't get your hands on a good oral supplement, I would try to go for the topical. It's like, you know, it's not worth getting your D3 levels up if you're going to be irritating your intestine and, you know, possibly having other negative effects. So just try to you know, play a little checks and balances there. I would say I'm in the sun all the time, but I still do some safeguards. I still take some, some vitamins just to, you know, I'm not the best. I'm not the most optimal every day, I would say. So I like, uh, you know, the Idea Labs Estrobon. I take that a lot. It has, it has vitamin A, it has D3, K2 and vitamin E. Um, so that's a topical, but that's something I use. I, I see benefit from it. Um, so yeah. Cool. All right, next one is from Liam Jean. Says, what do you think about the Inuits in North America who live healthily on all meat diet? I don't think they have any thyroid issues. Well, first of all, I haven't seen any data on their thyroid. Uh, if you have any, I would love to see that. That sounds really interesting. But I, as far as I know, I don't, I haven't seen any data on their thyroid. So, you know, you can only, <laughs> you can only diagnose what you can actually track to begin with. So if we're not looking at their thyroids, like, yeah, they don't have any documented <laughs> thyroid problems, but do they have any good thyroid function that's documented? I, I don't, I, I can't say for sure, but, um, the thing about the Inuit that's interesting um, is that there is there does seem to be this narrative in the low carb community that they're like super healthy and like, you know, they're amazing and Villar Stefansson or whatever his name is, all that kind of stuff. Um, 
but there was actually a, a review that I posted on Twitter. Um, and it basically said that like the idea that they get like what less cardiovascular disease and they have better mortality is essentially a myth. Um, and they also don't eat like an all ruminant meat diet, which I think would be better because they eat a lot of seafood. So I think, you know, you're potentially overdoing the polyunsaturated fats if you're pretty much eating only seafood, especially in the cold climate, because they're higher in, uh, in polyunsaturated fats. So that could be a contributing factor. But with all that being said, no carbs, a high PUFA, and <laughs> uh, they get, you know, pretty substantial rates of stroke and cardiovascular disease. I'm going to probably bet that their thyroid <laughs> is not optimal. <laughs> and they, But I mean, they probably eat thyroid too. Wouldn't that have some kind of effect as well? Yeah, no, that, that's, that's a really good point. Um, and that's another thing like that thyroid used to be, uh, included in a lot of these foods. So now it's like, Oh, why are you supplementing thyroid? Well, it's like, you know, historically we would have been just eating the thyroid and basically supplementing it that way. Um, so yeah, I think that would have a benefit, but at the same time, you know, the raw hormones are only going to get you so far if you have the poly, the high polyunsaturated fats that are preventing its utilization and then the lack of carbohydrates, which is preventing the signal to convert it into the more active forms of it. Um, and then also to lower free fatty acids and uh, improve its utilization that way. So I, yeah, I think, you know, eating some of the thyroid gland is definitely gonna have a positive impact, but it's not the whole story as well. All right, next, um, we got someone that said, I think I have developed P POTS after having long COVID. Can you help me? I honestly forgot what POTS stands for. Yeah. Okay, so postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, a uh, condition that affects blood flow. Um, and then I responded saying, I don't really know what you're talking about, but like, what are your symptoms? And he goes, heart rate spiking on sitting, Ron lying or standing from sitting. The longer I'm standing, the worse it gets. Causes weird tremors in my body too. So what I'll say about all the uh, long COVID uh, associated conditions is that it's likely the dysfunctional immune system that's really playing a role um, because you know so many people pretty much laugh the virus off, and you have people that really struggle with it that you know obviously die from it and have these complications, and then you have people that suffer from these quote unquote long COVID uh, symptoms. So I guess I'll just make this as general as possible, but I think it does come down to a dysfunctional immune system that is having trouble, like basically kind of a pseudo autoimmune state where, you know, your body's having a tough time turning the inflammation off because of the whatever possibly residues of the virus. Um, or, you know, it's just having a tough time turning off the inflammatory system because, you know, when you get sick, you're supposed to have a raise in inflammation and then it's supposed to go back down. But I think when you see a lot of these problems with so-called long COVID is that you're not really bringing it back down. And then of course, chronic inflammation has bad neurological effects, has pretty much a poor, <laughs> a bad impact on every organ system. So in, th in terms of what to do, the, the biggest immune, uh, supportive interventions that I could recommend would be vitamin D, vitamin D3. So everything that we said before also applies to this. Aspirin is good because it's direct antiviral, antibacterial, antifungal, and it has its own unique uh, pro-metabolic and anti-inflammatory effects. Um, other than that, uh, I also do know that a lot of these respiratory conditions, including COVID, there's a big origin in the intestine. So basically, this is actually one of the things that they found in the uh, Spanish flu epidemic was that a lot of it was being driven by endotoxin in the intestine. And it's like kind of like a weird connection how that works, but I don't really have time to explain all that now. But the point is that you would also ideally look into, you know, cleaning up the intestine, making sure that th that's working properly as well, because that's, you know, I think it's like 80% of your immune system is in your intestine. And it's such a sensitive region that can cause chronic inflammation and endotoxin is so ubiquitous in so many people that are sick. Uh, so that's also something that I would try to look into. All right, next we got, what supplements and diet changes help the body handle and eliminate PUFA, which is polyunsaturated fatty acid? Yeah, so obviously diet, cut them out. That's a no brainer. Um, so, handle and eliminate PUFA. So 
Okay, so th there's two ways you can go about this. You could take the keto approach, which is basically like balls to the wall, just try to rid your body of all of them as fast as possible, which again, could have deleterious effects if you're just flooding your bloodstream with a bunch of polyunsaturated fats all at once. Um, you could do that approach if you, know, if you feel like it's worth it. Um, I guess it would really depend on the case. But if you were to take the other approach, which would be like slowly have it go into the bloodstream so you're not flooding all of your organ systems in your bloodstream with all these all at once, um, you know, a low fat diet and with the fat that you do get, preferably being long chain saturated fats because even coconut oil, which I love, uh, is a lot of medium chain and shorter chain fatty acids. And these fats, uh, based on my research, they don't seem to be able to uh, replace the polyunsaturated fats in certain membranes, especially in the LDL particles and uh, in the liver. They don't seem to be able to replace the polyunsaturated fats from those because they're just too short. They're not really membrane constituents. Uh, but the longer chain saturated fats, especially from animals, so things like beef tallow and butter, uh, those are good sources of the long, longer chain saturated fats. And those have actually been used therapeutically to treat certain types of liver diseases that you know we kind of know are caused by the uh, excessive consumption of the polyunsaturated fats. So that would be, uh, so I would say, yeah, low fat in that approach. And the fact that you do get, try to make it longer chain saturated fat. Um, and then, yeah, plenty of carbohydrate. And then uh, aspirin and vitamin E are also gonna be uh, uh, very good there because aspirin's not only, but like it's only advertised a mechanism of action is to prevent the downstream conversion of the polyunsaturated fats into its inflammatory mediators. Um, so obviously, you know, if you wanna incorporate aspirin, that could be something to look into. And then vitamin E, uh, Again, it's only advertised uh, canonical role, I'll say in the body is to prevent the lipid peroxidation of these fats. So yeah, vitamin E would be a, a big one in, in addition to everything else. <laughs> so All right, so we got, <laughs> yeah, you wanna go? <laughs> yeah, so next we got, um, really hope I'm not bothering you guys. Guys with a question mark, yeah, there's two of us. Um, I'm a type one diabetic, went low carb two years ago, then carnivore starting December last year. Cut seed oils a little more than a year ago, but decided to exclude chicken and pork for carnivore. Started out good, but my blood glucose, my blood glucose ended up becoming stubbornly elevated. Then I found Ray, Ray Pete, Georgie, and Danny in late February and decided to include sugars back in the diet, <clears throat> but not flours. Having a rough, rough time starting my metabolism back up again. Blood sugar is very high. Any tips on carb and fat ratios? and a way to kickstart glucose oxidation. Yeah, so this um, this actually is a pretty common thing to see uh, with prolonged low carb diets, is that of course at first you're gonna have a drop in the blood glucose, but actually over time, uh, due to the uh, amount of free fatty acids that are in the blood and uh, the body becomes uh, so-called physiologically insulin resistant, at least that's what the low carbers like to say, um, where your blood glucose is actually going to start to become elevated. So even like Sean Baker, I remember a couple of years ago, Dr. Khan, vegan doctor called him out because he said, oh, I'm, I'm on carnivore for like a year or two or whatever. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm perfectly healthy. And then Dr. Khan got his blood work on his hands and showed that his blood glucose was actually 126 fasting, which is, that's like pre-diabetic. So yeah, I mean, that's just a consequence of cutting out the carbs and just never having them is that you will get that physiological insulin resistance. Um, so yeah, I think cutting the seed oils, cutting the chicken and the pork, if you can't get it from a pasture or, far, or a farm, cause that will have a greater amount of the polyunsaturated fats. That's gonna be critical, especially for type one diabetes. Um, cause I think that those have a damaging effect on the beta cells in the pancreas. Also again, uh, in the intestine, you'll have a sort of leak of endotoxin into the blood and that can cause systemic inflammation, which again is gonna uh, negatively affect the pancreatic beta cells. So again, the intestine is, is really crucial there. Um, and then in terms of including sugars back in the diet, you're saying that you have a, a rough time starting the metabolism back up and the blood sugar gets very high. Um, yeah, I mean, you're not producing insulin, so that doesn't <laughs> really surprise me. I guess the the best approach would be to, to do those things that I mentioned previously to try to protect the, the beta cells, you know, obviously keep taking insulin if you need to. But 
I know people are not trying to stay on that forever if they don't have to. So, you know, try to protect the, the beta cells. And I would keep it relatively low carb. You know, if you're gonna incorporate carbs, you know, maybe do like a small amount at each meal. Um, so that's like manageable for the little amount of insulin that you're producing or taking. Um, and that way you would kind of get the benefit of not becoming physiological, physiologically insulin resistant, but you also wouldn't have to deal with these massive blood, blood sugar spikes. Um, carb to fat ratios, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, if you're going to be eating, let's say you're eating, you know, 100 to like 125 grams of carbs a day, which is kind of in the middle between like what we consider low carb and high carb to do what we're talking about here. Um, you got to get energy from somewhere. So you are going to want to increase the amount of fat, but just make sure that it's saturated fat. Um, I think in this case, the coconut oil would be like much more useful because it's those medium chain and those short chain fatty acids and they would they do get preferentially oxidized so that's like a nice like easy source of energy um so yeah those would be the things that i would try to work on cool yeah. and then the, the next one is um i think a more general question would be what are things you'd recommend to somebody who wants to optimize their mental performance uh which is critical thinking memory ability to work through slumps yeah. So shout out to this guy. I actually don't remember his name, but I remember his profile pic, but he's a, he's a huge fan of, uh, he's a huge fan of the channel. He's getting into methylene blue now, which is probably something that I would recommend in terms of this, uh, this question, but shout out to him. He's, he's a big fan and, uh, really supportive. Um, so things to optimize mental performance. Uh, so I think this on like a more sort of philosophical level, I would say, you know, a lot of people think that the way to perform, uh, optimize mental performance is to just like go ham and like, you know, be as energetic as possible and just crank out a bunch of work. Like it's like what people think, like when they take Adderall or something, but I actually would not at all recommend that approach. I think that's like a manic sort of like aggressive approach. And I think the mental state that you want to be in is like a more relaxed sort of alert. So like you have energy, you know, you're thinking clearly, um, but you're also not like things aren't just flying in and out of your head, like you're not going insane. Um, so that allows you to sort of, you know, settle down, look at things, um, appreciate them, critically analyze them better rather than, you know, just flying through things. So in terms of that, one thing, uh, a couple of things that I've noticed that really get me in that sort of relaxed, optimal mode, obviously caffeine, but caffeine can get you jittery and whatnot. So I'll just make sure to try to take it with a meal uh, if you're drinking coffee, you know, maybe sugar or honey or milk uh, with the coffee. And then I think thiamine is really good for this. Um, someone actually posted a video on Twitter where Ray Pete said uh, 100 milligrams of thiamine gives you access to every thought you've ever had, which is a pretty insane statement. But honestly, I don't know if I disagree with them because <laughs> I take thiamine and it's uh, definitely noticeable. So thiamine's vitamin B1, I would try to get the uh, thiamine HCL version of that because it's pretty cheap and it's like very well absorbed. Um, and then you can explore the lowering of serotonin options because serotonin and dopamine have a inverse correlation. So anytime you're lowering your serotonin, you're increasing your dopamine, which is obviously going to help uh, in terms of optimizing mental performance. And it also relaxes you in a good way. So if your serotonin is high, you'll tend to be like sluggish and like foggy, like you'll be tired. You're not relaxed. But if your serotonin is lower, you're more just like chilled and like willing to think about things instead of this sort of like moping around kind of state that serotonin seems to promote. Um, yeah, and then overall just optimizing energy metabolism. So obviously methylene blue is something good for that. Uh, and of course, all the things with the diet that we always talk about. I would say um, also I, well, we both tried, um, there was a Gorilla Mine product. Um, Derek Moore plays Sport Dates. He, it's his company. Um, he's on YouTube. Um, Gorilla Mind Rush was, I felt like I, I was like a superhero. Like it, I would say it was better than Adderall or anything like that. I mean, I would think for in the short term, like a very low dose <clears throat> instant release, like Adderall, like amphetamine or Ritalin would, would be a good, a good option short term. Obviously you don't want to do that long term, but if you got something that you want to do, um, but the Gorilla Mind Rush, it, I don't know what exactly ingredient did it in that, but you can look through the ingredients and I would say that 
whatever is in there really does optimize performance. And I know he has a, a product, uh, Gorilla Mind Smooth, which I've been wanting to try. Um, obviously, Methylene Blue too, but we mentioned that. But I, I think there there are different nootropics that that could have benefits. And I would say, I would say look at uh, the big ones. Like I would say look at the label of Gorilla Mind Rush and try some things that are in there. Um, because, I don't know something. The combination it was it's it was pretty nuts. Like how much of a performance boost it could give you. That's, yeah, that's what I would it say. Was, it was definitely insane. Um, <laughs> like took that before a final and I finished it in like an hour and I got in it. It was pretty, it was pretty insane. Um, but yeah, no, I think, I think it's a good idea. I also think um, I've heard a lot of good things about uh, L-tyrosine. It's like a dopamine precursor. Uh, and I've heard friends who have taken it basically say it's like a smoother version of Adderall. Like you can get to sleep. Uh, but it's like really good for mental focus because tyrosine is a precursor for both dopamine and thyroid hormone, uh, which are obviously two in insanely crucial things when it comes to optimizing mental performance. Um, so that's something to look into. I've also heard good things about lion's mane uh, and other things like that. But yeah, we're pretty, we're pretty, we haven't gone much into the nootropic rabbit hole. I think um, I think that's a, that's a good video idea would be just give like a brief overview of the different mechanisms and whatnot. And sort of like a tangible way to approach how you would take them uh so that's definitely on the list but unfortunately the list is like two or three hundred videos long so i don't know when we'll get to that <laughs> all right um next person asks how good is maple syrup is it as good or better than raw honey he also added um also meat is the best thing in the world pause um <laughs> I actually don't know a ton about maple syrup. Don't you know a little bit about it? Um, not really. Just like my intuition says that it's, you know, it comes out of a tree, like, and it's sugar. Uh, I don't know why it wouldn't be good. I don't know why it wouldn't be good. Uh, it's not processed at all. And I would assume that it has some nutrients and minerals in it. No, I haven't really looked into it, but I mean, I would assume it does. So, but I mean, yeah. I don't think it's as good as raw honey though. Yeah, no, I don't like even if maple syrup is good and I don't have a reason to believe that it's not. I still think that raw honey, there's a ton of research behind it. You know, go check out our video on, on raw honey if you're interested in that. But tons of different unique compounds uh, in raw honey, in addition to the, obviously the sugar um, that make it pretty much a superfood. So I would be hard pressed to conclude that maple syrup is superior to it. So, but you know, we can all live together. We can have maple syrup and raw honey. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> yeah, I would I would say go for it just from, from intuition. Yeah. All right. Um, Dr. Zara asks, what's the peatiest animal in the world? I'll, I'll give my opinion. Um, so in terms of diet, it's probably going to be like a black bear because they eat uh, they eat lean fish <laughs> that are low in PUFA and they get the uh, they get the skin of the fish so that's high in glycine and they eat honey and they eat fruit <laughs> and they eat tubers that's a pretty that's a pretty damn good diet and I think I mean I posted the thing about grizzly bear milk but I think that they're also known to like if they can like snag some milk from another animal so in terms of diet the bear would be the peatiest but um, in terms of like vibe, the peatiest animal is going to be the, uh, the pygmy marmoset. And if you don't know what that is, we'll, we'll show a picture on the screen, but it's, it's, I think it's God's sense of humor, honestly, like this thing is fucking hilarious to look at. And it's like so tiny and cute. And it's just like, it just makes you feel good to like, look at it. And, um, yeah, in my opinion, that would be the peatiest animal. It's also my favorite animal, the pygmy marmoset. <laughs> All right, I'll defer to your opinion on that one. <laughs> um, want to read this one? Yeah, we're like actually out of order here, so um, I'll just read the next one that I see. Um, oh my guy, <laughs> Doctor Lagacos, Lagacos, Lagacos. Phil, just doctor. Tell me, um. <laughs> Tell me if I'm pronouncing that wrong, but Bill's my guy. Uh, you know, we're subscribers to his Patreon. Uh, he produces a lot of good com uh, content. He's a PhD in, in uh, biochem. I think he, do he does a lot of good work with like uh, circadian rhythms and stuff. 
Um, so he's the man. Go check him out if you haven't. But he says something, something, blue P, which I'm going to go ahead and assume that this is from our previous conversation. Where we were talking about what, what it means if you take methylene blue and your P is blue versus if it's not. Um, and my answer to that question that I think you're asking is basically if your P is blue, uh, when you're taking methylene blue, that essentially means that you're wasting it, obviously. Um, and that's something to look out for because, you know, if you're taking, let's say you're taking five milligrams of methylene blue for a week, a day, um, and then your P becomes blue. I think that's a pretty good sign because that's like a relatively low dose of methylene blue. And it means that, you know, it's only, um, it's pretty it's a demand driven process essentially where the methylene blue gets taken up in the tissues and is used in the mitochondria, like where it really needs to be. Um, so if you're peeing a lot of it out, that is a pretty good sign that you're probably producing energy just fine. And the methylene blue is not really having a, a ton of good effects. It also means that your nitric oxide is probably pretty low. But if you're peeing out clear, um, that means that it is getting used up because the oxidized form of methylene blue is clear. Um, and it could also mean that, or whatever, it's colorless. Um, and it could also mean that it is getting taken up into tissues actively where it is exerting its amazing effects. <laughs> All right, next, uh, Bruno Croco says, what's your thoughts of what is the main driver of kidney stones? It is clearly that everyone eats too much spinach. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Paul Saladino for that nonsense i love paul but that was that was insane i don't know why he even thought about saying that but um <laughs> yeah uh the main driver of kidney stone so sh also shout out to my guy bruno he's a he's a big supporter um he hates seed oils i think more than anyone on the planet um the guy is just a pubmed churning out <laughs> churning out tweets about seed oils and studies just constantly the guy's insane um, but I love him. So anyway, uh, he actually has a thread about this on his Twitter on uh, the how seed oils can potentially cause uh, kidney stones. Unfortunately, I haven't had a ton of time to like actually read through all of it. Um, so I would honestly probably defer to him on that. I don't even know if this is a question or if he just wants me to promote his thread. So I'm just gonna go ahead and say go to him and uh, check out his thread on it because at this point, I wouldn't be surprised if seed oils did pretty much anything in the body. So, yeah. <laughs> you don't think oxalates play any role, though? I mean, they can, but realistically, like, <laughs> who's eaten, you know, enough almonds and spinach to, like, get kidney stones versus who's eating enough seed oils to do it? Like, I'm not saying, like, it definitely can be a cause, but, you know, you'd have to be, like, a raw vegan or something along those lines to really run into that issue, which I obviously would not recommend. <laughs> right, next, uh, it's our only question on our TikTok post. And user 57865440 asks, how does one best convince the average person that PUFA is bad and sugar is good? Um, so, Mr. Telephone Number, um, I disagree with this question. <laughs> I know you can't really disagree with the question, but I disagree with this question because if you're asking how to convince someone that it's bad, then you probably shouldn't be. Like, you know, I don't want you, I don't want anybody to like hear the information that we say and then just like try to convince people of it just because they heard it from us, you know? Our videos and every, all the content that we put out is hopefully like good tools to like educate people and, and spark their imaginations and, and inspire them to like go look look into things and try it. Um, but yeah, no, I would not just like want anybody just regurgitating what we say without actually knowing about it or looking into it. But if the question is, okay, dude, like I do know about it, but I just don't know how to sum it up to someone who's not like in science. That's a different question. Um, but to that, the easiest way to really get across uh, why PUFA, well, PUFA itself is not bad. It's just like the overconsumption of it. But the easiest thing you could say is that when, <laughs> when you ingest them, they turn into toxins in your body. And that's like the simplest way to, to talk about it because it's true. 
Um, and the fact that these byproducts are toxins is not even disputed by mainstream medicine. I mean, maybe maybe the vegans over at Harvard have uh, something to say about that, but you know, I wouldn't put too much stock into that. Um, that would probably be like the easiest way to sum it up. And then I would also think like on a more common sense level, um, yeah, Jack, what, what would you say on a more common sense level, like historically, like how to sum it up? I would say it's, it's pretty much like an industrial byproduct. If you look at any other oil, like any animal oil, it's pretty easy to obtain um, from an avocado, an olive, or coconut. The oil is really easy to get out of whatever it is, but like, how do you really get oil out of a soybean? You really gotta fuck with it, like a lot. <laughs> um, so that's what I would say. I would just use stuff that's, I would say like, look, this, this stuff's made in a factory and the other oils are, you, you can literally make that yourself. Um, so yeah. I would say but something I'll along. But on the, on the on the flip side of that, like if we're asking why sugar is good, you know, sugar is made in a factory, but like historically, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong here, Jack, but like historically, like we've been eating refined sugar. We've been eating foods with sugar in them. And there's definitely populations that, you know, the French eat a lot of sugar and they were fine. I remember there's the paper uh, that we talked about in the Lustig video where people were eating, you know, a good amount of sugar back in the, uh, in the thirties, uh, but very little of these vegetable oils that are high in PUFA. Um, so yeah, Jack, what's your, what's your take on that? Like historically? I mean, I, I said, I would say one for as far as I know, even though you do have to process sugar, like, I think there's a lot less that goes on with sugar as far as like, you know, seed oils, you gotta like bleach them, deodorize them, dissolve them in a hex hexane. <laughs> um, and yeah, sugar has been around a lot longer. I wouldn't say something's necessarily bad because it's from a factory, but I would say that because like, the average person, I would say like the average intelligence person would think like, you know, made in a factory bad. And that would be a pretty convincing argument to to the average person, I, I would say. Like if you're not trying to really red pill someone who's like very intelligent, could like understand a, a lot, I would say that that's, that would be just a good strategy to go to go with, my opinion. Yeah, yeah. and then the, the sugar is good thing. I mean, that one doesn't require much thought at all. Like if you're just trying to simplify it as much as possible, you just say like your body, if you don't eat it, your body literally will rip down your organs in order to make it itself. Like it's it's that important that like, even if you like, there's no getting around the fact that your body needs sugar. So I think that's the easiest way to, to go about that. People have been eating sugar forever and no one really started getting fat until after seed oils. I would say that's an argument for both, the easiest argument for both of them. Exactly, yeah, I agree with that. Jack, what's next up on yours? Because we're definitely not in the same order. I I'm got um, vehicle man's slaughter. Is <laughs> next? What do you got next? Yeah, we, we could do that. Um, okay, so vehicle man's laughter says, <laughs> uh, "How would you go about uh, losing fat when eating according to repeat guidelines? Since fat loss requires liberating free fatty acids, the repeat diet plus aspirin plus niacinamide all inhibit this." Um, so I guess I'll handle the first part of this. Uh, so, okay, yes, fat loss does require the fat to be liberated. Well, I actually don't even know if that's true. Like you can burn fat in the adipocyte itself, but it's just that it prefers sugar, like pretty much every organ. But <laughs> um, yeah, no, I don't, that doesn't mean that you have to like dump a obscene quantity of the free fatty acids into the blood, like a low carb diet or something. And the other thing is that with a low carb diet, like if you actually look at the studies that compare it to like a well-designed, like a well-designed low carb diet and a well-designed low fat diet that are, you know, the same amount of calories and the same amount of protein. I'm not saying that this is necessarily practical, but it just illustrates the point. Um, like you see the same amount of fat loss for the reason that, you know, you're eating less fat, so you're going to store less fat, even if you're burning less fat. And on the flip side, if you're eating a higher fat, lower carb diet, you're going to be storing more fat, storing as in you're going to have a greater amount of fat going into your fat cells, but you're also going to get more on the other side. So it's really about the net fat balance. So, um, we see the same amount of fat loss if all those other things are equated. Um, and then the fact of liberating free fatty acids and aspirin and all this, um, those things limit, like uh, they limit lipolysis, but they don't, which is the liberating of free fatty acids into the blood. They, they do limit that, but they don't shut it off entirely. I don't think there's anything that you could take that would give you like zero free fatty acids in the blood. Um, and if it did, it would probably kill you. Uh, so 
yeah, it's just that they lower that amount. Um, but yeah, in terms of losing fat, I mean, there's there's two Ps, well, there's three Ps of losing fat, and that's protein, you want it high, PUFA, you want it low, penis, you would preferably have one because it's harder to lose fat as a woman. Um, <laughs> Also, if you want, why do so many people eventually have a bad experience eating PD? They feel great for like six months, but then start dealing with brain fog, weight gain, hair loss, candida, et cetera, et cetera. Is there some factor they're commonly missing? Um, well, what I would say is that I don't think, first of all, that hasn't been my experience. It's honestly been the opposite is that people don't like it at first and they start to gain the weight. And then over time, their metabolism picks up and they lean out and they you know they lose excess water and things of that nature i've never heard of someone gaining like getting candida going from low carb to just eating sugar and that's been proven in studies that you know just eating carbs is not enough to foster a fungal overgrowth even though that's their main source of fuel hair loss i definitely haven't seen that i mean but you ne can't necessarily chalk that up to the diet um so I don't know, there's there's a lot going on here, but th this hasn't really been my experience and I'm not here to discredit people's experience that that is. But what I would say is that, you know, it's not just about the diet, it's about so many other factors in your life. It's about your light, your light environment, it's about your sleep, it's about, you know, maybe some targeted supplementation. It's about, you know, uh, everything. It's about your social life, it's about all those types of things. So, so you know, the diet is an important part that we talk about, obviously, probably too much, but, but um, you know, there's so many other factors that go into health that I don't think um, these, I don't like, if we're just to have it in isolation and keep everything else equal, I don't think that eating a higher sugar, lower fat diet is going to cause all of these things without other external factors playing a role. But Jack, you can let me know what you think about that. Yeah, I mean, that's that's all pretty good. I, I would agree. I would just say one thing, maybe a little off topic. Uh, when I first started taking thyroid, uh, tyronine, like T3, um, I got like really bad hair loss for like three or four days, like really bad. Like I was losing a lot of hair and that was like the only variable I know of that I changed in my life. And then that completely went away and my hair has been like really strong. I, you know, I barely lose any in the shower as far as I know. It was just some, some weird thing that like right when I started taking thyroid, I guess, I think we theorized that it might've been something like all like the bad, all the, like the, the, the damaged hair was kind of like falling out. I don't know, but. Just, uh, yeah, that's possible. Uh, and it's also like, you know, if you're going to raise your metabolism, you also are probably going to raise your requirements of different nutrients. So, you know, if you're eating a bunch of refined sugar and orange juice and eating ice cream, but you're not eating, you know, eggs or you're not eating liver or you're not eating shellfish or all these foods that are so nutrient dense that we are such staunch advocates for, then yeah, like you are going to have some problems, but is that the problem? Is that a problem with the, the higher carbohydrate intake or is that a problem with that you're not eating all these foods that you should be on top of that? Well said. So. M Naya, I think, <laughs> says, uh, and she actually DM me about this a while ago and I, I apologize that I haven't been able to get back to it, but I, I did want you know a way to be able to fully express my thoughts on this because it's not a simple subject. So she says, would love to hear your insight into ADHD, whether it's dietary, environmental causes things and working on overcoming the symptoms. So, okay. So the first part is there's not just one type of ADHD, um, there's multiple types. Well, that's at least now being recognized by mainstream medicine, but it's it's not, it's very uh, heterogeneous like distribution of symptoms. It's like one of these like umbrella diagnoses, like IBS, which is basically like, okay, if you don't have like Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, but you have gut problems, then you have IBS, but that could be for a million different reasons and people have like a million different symptoms that go along with it. Um, and I say all that to say that like, it really matters the symptoms and I don't think lumping it into one category of ADHD is necessarily gonna be helpful. So I, I think um, in, in this girl's experience, she said that she just had trouble paying attention. She wasn't like super hyperactive but like she like wouldn't answer texts um, and like her thoughts would just be drifting away and things of that nature. Um, and that honestly sounds like it could be elevated serotonin, um, but it's definitely some kind of metabolic issue in the brain combined with uh, systemic stress, I would say. So, you know, everything with the diet obviously applies, but in terms of other things that specifically can target a brain energy metabolism better would be 
methylene blue, obviously. Um, trying to keep serotonin at bay is going to be a, a big deal. So again, you know, looking for symptoms of bacterial overgrowth, checking how your digestion is doing. Um, you know, if you're not pooping two or three times a day, that's not a good sign for your digestive health. Um, and that, you know, endotoxin triggering serotonin is going to have a systemic effect and especially can have these sort of, I, in my experience, like when I had, now that I know like what high serotonin feels like, unfortunately, um, it was really like, like I was kind of like in a fog, like, yeah, I would forget things. Like I wouldn't, I wasn't as like attentive. Like I couldn't like really pay attention to things unless I like really sat down or, um, you know, uh, sorry, things, things of that nature. So yeah, I think, I think serotonin is going to play a big role here. Um, and then improving systemic, but more importantly, brain energy metabolism with things like methylene blue caffeine, maybe. Um, but yeah, so that's probably the best I can give you without getting like a deeper dive into um, without getting a deeper dive into like your symptoms and your history and whatnot, but that, that's what I have to say. I don't know if that all made sense of it. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So, okay. So up next, uh, our guy, Smokey Smoke, another avid fan. I've actually had some Patreon conversations with this, with this guy. Good guy. Love him to death, even though he's a little bit annoying sometimes. Uh, <laughs> no hard feelings, brother. Um, <laughs> can you go into a little depth about the Randall cycle? Many keto people use it as an argument against carbs. Um, then he has a powerlifting question after this, which we can get into. But um, so the Randall cycle is basically the uh, it's the process by which the carb and fat oxidation oppose each other. Um, so basically, if you're eating a higher carbohydrate diet, you're going to have less liberation of free fatty acids into the blood because of insulin and all these other factors that lower. Uh, the amount of lipolysis out of the adipose and which in turn is obviously going to lower the amount of fat that you're oxidizing. And then on the flip side, if you're not eating carbs and you have a lot of these free fatty acids in the blood, so the free fatty acids themselves, but this is the important part, but not triglycerides, free fatty acids, but not triglycerides. So free fatty acids, they come out of your adipose uh, tissue and that can block, uh, I believe it's both the uptake of the glucose into the cell and it's also the uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase, which basically means that you're converting more of it into lactic acid. So this is actually something you can see in diabetics because you know pretty much every disease state is characterized by a high level of free fatty acids in the blood. Um, and diabetics do tend to have higher, both levels of free fatty acid and higher levels of lactic acid. So in terms of the keto people using it as an argument against carbs, it really doesn't make a lot of sense because you know, if you eat more carbs and less fat, you're going to burn more carbs and less fat. And if you eat more fat and less carbs, you're going to do that, right? You're going to burn that. So I'm not really sure what the argument is that somehow the Randall cycle is a bad. I mean, I guess, you know, if you're eating like a mixed diet or like a high carb and high fat diet, then you will have, you know, sort of both sides of the coin. But the, the reason that I brought up the triglycerides thing is that postprandially, if you eat fat, it gets packaged into triglycerides, or not packaged. Well, yeah, it gets packaged in into triglycerides, and then it gets sent in lipoproteins to the different tissues, and then it gets uh, converted into a free fatty acid once it comes into contact with the cell. So it's not floating around as a free fatty acid. It's floating around in a lipoprotein bound by uh, a glycerol backbone, which makes up the triglyceride. So that lipoprotein is not contributing to the blocking of the oxidation of glucose it only happens when you have the free fatty acids in the blood um and you can have some what's called free fatty acid spillover which is if you eat like a really high fat meal you will have you know a bunch of triglycerides but you also have some free fatty acids in the blood um but with all that being said i still don't really understand how that uh is an argument against carbohydrate if anything it would be an argument against fat intake <laughs> because it blocks the oxidation of it um but you know, if you're a keto person and you believe that we should be having a lot of lipolysis and we should be burning a lot of fat, then I could see that argument, but I just don't agree with the premise. And then how to start powerlifting the base pilled in a way. Um, so I think a lot of powerlifting approaches are shit because uh, a lot of times it'll be like, all right, I'm gonna go in one day, I'm just gonna hammer bench, I'm gonna do like whatever, eight sets of bench, and like I'm gonna you know, push myself like to exhaustion or whatever. 
and then whatever they can't bench again for another week or so because they exhausted themselves and they come back and you know they're grinding out the reps and it's just not really like an efficient way of going about it so i would check out uh jeremy hamilton who is a uh, like world record powerlifter and basically his approach is um he does low volume but high frequency so basically and this is what i do so instead of you know working your way up to 90 percent of your one rep max and then hitting it for two and then trying to do another double with it failing or maybe going down to 85 percent and then just constantly grinding out reps is not the way you want to go about it you want to focus on quality of reps you know make sure that your reps are explosive that you have good form and that you're hitting them as often as possible so you know if i if I, let's say, go in and I bench press 225 on my first set for five, and then the next set I can only do that for four, and then the next set I go, I strip it down to 205, and then I go for five again, and then it just keeps going down, and I do like eight sets of that. How is that in comparison to, what if I bench every other day, but I only do one or two sets per workout, you know, and sets that are not like killing me with exhaustion? Um, I think that's the better approach because then you can recover faster and you can hit the lift more often, which allows you to, to get the form down better, make sure that your reps are good, um, and you know also not sacrifice your recovery. All right, cool. Um, what do you got next? Um, okay, let me back up. Let's see what we got. All right, so let's do. We have Mr. Conesser Dopamine, okay, Schizoid, says, you used to appreciate fasting. You have videos about it on YouTube. Now, after learning about the pro-metabolic <laughs> approach to nutrition, you uh, do you still recommend it? Can 16 to 18 to 24 hour fasts help you lose weight and improve your health? Um, yes, they can help you lose weight and improve your health, uh, but it's I think it's a relative conversation. So again, like, you know, if you're obese and extremely insulin sensitive, then yeah, you should probably be fasting. You should probably be doing low carb to lean out and, you know, get your body back to a semblance of homeostasis. I, you know, I've repeatedly said that. Um, but I, I think it's relative. So, you know, if you're having a lot of benefits from fasting, you know, the things are that people say, oh, I'm like so much mentally clear, like it's good to like rest your gut or whatever. So those two things can be achieved <laughs> without the deleterious effects of fasting. And a lot of times, you know, people say that they feel better mentally when they're fasting. It's because they're getting a surge in cortisol and stress hormones. And, you know, it can be euphoric. It can be fun. It's like, you know, um, we did this analogy, like in one of the earlier videos, but it was like, you know, if you do like a line of blow, like you're going to get a surge in all these stress hormones, you're going to feel really good. <laughs> that doesn't necessarily mean that you should be doing that, you know, uh, as a, as a approach for mental clarity. <laughs> So uh, I think the, the context is just really important. I, yeah, I, I do still think that fasting has its role, uh, but it's about the context. You know, I don't think that everyone needs to be fasting. In fact, I think most people shouldn't be fasting, but there are people that can benefit from it. And if you are benefiting from it and you know, you're already lean and you're already like relatively healthy, I would try to pinpoint the reasons why it makes you feel good and why it's benefiting you so that you can attack that with a more uh, sophisticated or optimal approach rather than just, you know, cutting out food entirely. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to fast, don't, don't go nuts with it. Definitely. All right. So next up I have Ash, Ash J Williams, nine, nine says, what is your opinion on the niacin flush? IE is presence of the flush indication of overdose slash toxicity, or is an unavoidable byproduct of taking niacin well to answer the second part first no it's it's completely avoidable just by taking niacinamide instead of taking niacin i don't know why this is even like a discussion because niacinamide is i'm pretty sure boosts your nad levels better than niacin does and you don't get a freaking histamine reaction where your skin flares up and you feel like you're about to die burning like that's what the niacin flush is it's a histamine reaction and to anyone saying that we should be taking niacin and the flush is somehow good, I would be extremely skeptical of anything that they have to say on the matter because that is like incontroversially like not a good thing. Um, so yeah, if you want to take, you know, if you want to get more B3, 
then I would take niacinamide, which has like zero side effects and is probably better in terms of actually boosting your NAD levels. So it's regarding hydration. What's, what's, what is the importance in water intake versus mineral intake? I use reverse osmosis filter and wonder whether remineralization is necessary other than magnesium due to the lack of it in most American food sources. Um, what is the importance of water versus mineral? Well, they're equally important. If anything, people are not getting enough minerals and drinking too much water, which is kind of a meme at this point, but everyone's talking about just drink a gallon of water a day to stay hydrated. It's like, you're actually, <laughs> if you're drinking distilled water or mineral poor water, you know, it's one thing if you're getting like a good quality spring water and you, you know that you're getting like a decent amount of magnesium and maybe calcium and potassium and some other things in there. But most people are not getting that. <laughs> um, especially if you're drinking freaking tap water, you know, I would stay a, a, the hell away from that for a multitude of reasons. One of which we'll be discussing in the next video. But um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I would I would try to focus on mineral intake and then just go by taste, uh, by thirst with water. You know, I don't I don't think it's ever a good idea to like go against your body's cravings. Number two, the body doesn't know when it's thirsty. I love this. Well, first of all, it does know when it's thirsty. You can perceive thirst, hunger, hot, cold, temperature. You can perceive a lot of things. You have 52 perceptions of perceiving a lot of stuff. Um, so when someone tells you, well, sometimes when you're hungry, you're really thirsty, they're just making stuff up. Um, obviously there's like some exceptions to that. Like if you're a heroin addict, like I would probably, you know, not just keep doing the heroin because you're craving it. But um, with something like water, <laughs> like there's no reason to just be slamming water if you're not thirsty. And on the other side, there's no reason to not drink water if you are thirsty. Um, so I don't know, this conversation, like it doesn't annoy me, but it's like, I just hate talking about it because it's like, why do I have to spell this out? Like, why do I have to tell people to drink water when they're thirsty? And it's not, it's obviously not the gentleman who's asking the questions fault. I just think it's all of the information out there about pounding water and how important it is to get eight glasses of water, a gallon of water, whatever it is a day. I just, you know, it frustrates me a little bit. It's just um, so easy. It's so easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, drink when you're thirsty. Focus yeah and focus on you know focus on your nutrient intake and you know i think you'll be fine in terms of hydration i mean there are hormonal factors that play into how well you're hydrated i know estrogen can cause like water retention i think cortisol can do the same and then other hormones can make you pee out way too much uh to the point where you're really craving salt and water and things because you're just constantly peeing it out but that doesn't seem to be discussed pretty much at all <laughs> but he also um, said um he uses the reverse osmosis filter and wonders whether remineralization is necessary. I'd say why not, right? If you have a good source of minerals, like yeah, and you're totally. gonna and you're gonna filter it anyway. Um, it probably is much much more economical than buy, buying glass bottles of spring water, which I've been doing. Um, but yeah, I would say why not? It's get a good source of minerals and throw it in. Yeah, and even if you don't like necessarily have minerals to add to the water itself, like. You know, the magnesium, that's an easy thing you can supplement. Um, but everything else, mineral wise, if your diet is good, then you should be getting plenty of all these other minerals. And, you know, water doesn't have to be a source of that. Water can serve the other side of the equation, which is to give you water, not minerals. Um, but yeah. All right. That's what I'm saying. The, let's do the next. What do you got next? Um, Konizer? No, we, Konizer. We, already, we already got that one. Okay, um, let's do. Let's do Mr. Market. You see that? Yep, sounds good. Okay, so Mr. Market says, uh, when you're trying to build muscle, what does your diet look like? This is something Ray P doesn't necessarily spend a, time, a lot of time writing about. I'd just like to add an ad addendum here that <laughs> Ray P is negative on consuming many bodybuilding staples in high quantities like eggs, which are high in PUFA, red muscle beet, which is high in tryptophan. Should we worry about uh, limiting these foods if we're trying to build muscle? So to answer the first part of the question, what does my diet look like if I'm trying to build muscle? Pretty much this, like I don't really go on like bulks or anything anymore. You know, I am, um, what's really gonna dictate if I'm putting on muscle or not is how I'm training. So right now I'm training with more of like a powerlifting style, which is not optimal for muscle hypertrophy. Uh, but you know, if I want to gain some size somewhere, then I'm gonna go to a more bodybuilding 
style routine with like lower weights and a little bit higher reps. Um, the diet aspect of it, you know, I think, um, I think you should always be eating in a way that favors good body composition. You know, if you're, unless you're like an actual bodybuilder and you're going to go on like a bulk where you want to like put on like a massive amount of size and you're like, and you want to like get fat in the process. And then if you're going to do the flip side of that and then drastically cut your calories to get stupid shredded where you got veins in your butt cheeks, um, <laughs> you know, I, I don't think that's most people's goal. If it is, then that's a completely different story. But, you know, if you're just worried about getting some muscle, then I wouldn't even, you know, I would obviously focus on protein as king, you know, make sure you get one gram per pound of body weight. And that doesn't include gelatinous sources, by the way, because that's not really used for muscle protein synthesis. You would obviously want to get the gelatinous uh, amino acids in on top of that. But um, yeah, protein is king. And then carbs is going to be second because uh, they're just more anabolic in terms of insulin and stimulating muscle protein synthesis and things like that. Uh, and then in terms of the other side, you know, I don't think you have to eat a ton of fat, but including some good saturated fats uh, is known. Like in, if you're swapping it for polyunsaturated fats, uh, and I think if you're doing it relative to a, to a uh, lower fat diet. The saturated fats do have a positive effect on uh, testosterone, which obviously is crucial if you're gonna be trying to build muscle. But yeah, my diet pretty much stays the same all the time and I track the macros and it's pretty much like, and I don't do that very often, but I did like what I considered to be like a representative day uh, because I hate tracking macros. <laughs> but my representative day was like 350 carbs to 400, which is like pretty insane. But yeah, I'm pretty active and I'm like pretty, not like I'm not massive but like I got a decent amount of muscle on me um and you know I consider my metabolic rate to be like in a pretty good spot so uh yeah it's like 350 to 400 grams of carbs and then like my protein's probably around like 180 to 200 maybe like 20 grams of that protein are coming from gelatin or gelatinous sources and then the fat is around it can go from 60 to I would say around 80 which is actually like a pretty big window but um, yeah, I mean, I'm not like adding fat to anything. You know, I'll have a couple of egg yolks, but yeah, in terms of like avoiding these foods, I mean, I wouldn't be gorging on eggs uh, because of the high poofa. I think, you know, I think, but I think like milk is like one of the most anabolic foods there is, you know, getting a, a couple of eggs a day. And then I don't see a reason to limit red meat unless you have like iron problems. Like if you're, if you're like accumulating too much iron, but uh, in terms of tryptophan, and then on the flip side of that, you can also give blood to dump some of that iron. But uh, tryptophan, I, I, I think the whole tryptophan thing, because tryptophan, if anyone doesn't know, tryptophan is a precursor to serotonin, which is why uh, Ray Pete and others like to say to lower it. But I think that's like very low on the list of things to do if you want to lower serotonin, because it's like, it's not the rate limiting step, the rate limiting in most people, not rate limiting, but the limiting factor in most people is going to be uh, the intestine and the bacteria that's there. So like, you know, if you don't have like bacterial overgrowth, it doesn't matter how much tryptophan you're eating, you're not going to get it converted into serotonin. All right, so, cool. Let's, uh, what do you got next? All right, let's do uh, my guy, the carnivore kid from Australia. Uh, shout out to him and shout out to his homies that love our videos in Australia. They actually posted I know they have like their little movie nights uh, down under and they like to uh, they like to watch our videos. So shout out to them. Glad you're enjoying the content. Uh, we'll keep it rolling. So hopefully we can answer this question well. Uh, he goes, uh, thoughts on eating raw egg white or should you just have the yolk raw? Uh, and should I worry about the acidity of orange juices for my teeth? Jack, you want to take the egg yolk part? Because I know that you have played around with that. Um. Well, raw egg whites, like for me, I kind of have a trouble eating, eating a lot more. Like when I'm trying to put on muscle, like I find it harder to, to, to put, to, to eat more than to eat less. I, I think it's really easy to eat to, for myself to not eat as much. I never really got any problems with, with raw egg whites. That's what I used to do. Like when I would have here, here's what I did. I don't know. I don't know how. It was effective for me, I think. You could easily up your protein intake by like 50 grams a day by just having like a, a good amount of egg whites and it's easy, you just drink them and you could have it after a meal, you could have it during a meal. 
really whatever. And it doesn't really fill you up because it's all liquid, but it's straight high quality protein. Um, but then the problem that I've seen is with avidin, which as far as I know, it binds to biotin. So it'll get, so when you're eating the raw, the, 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 the raw egg whites, it, instead of cooking them, it kind of binds up your, your, your biotin and you don't get as much biotin in. So the way I, what I did to, to, I guess, combat this was I would always have like either days on or like morning or night, like let's say in the morning I would drink raw, raw egg whites. And then like at night I would have like cooked eggs. So like the, I'm still getting, so I'm getting the biotin in at a different time. So let's say it does block, like the next day I'll have eggs and get enough biotin. And I wouldn't always, I wouldn't like be slugging egg whites all the time. I would just do it at certain times and then have eggs and other biotin rich foods at other times. So I would kind of maximize the best of both worlds. But I mean, yeah, I would say egg whites, you could just buy them in a carton and the, the easiest way to get a lot more protein in the diet, in my opinion. Yeah, Um. in terms of the yolk being raw, I don't think you would ever have to worry about that. So the whole like, I think this question might be also referring to this trend where people slunk eggs, which is basically like they crack a bunch and they like literally just drink them raw yolk and, and white. And look, I'm I'm not here to discredit anyone that has done that because it seems to be working for a lot of people. But what I will say is that most people are concerned with the uh, salmonella. Uh, salmonella is pretty much never going to affect the yolk uh, in the same way that like, you're not gonna get too much bacteria like on the outside of a steak, which is why, you know, you can serve it raw on the inside as long as it's cooked on the outside. It's the same thing with the eggs is that, you know, you never really worry about there being back too much bacteria on the yolk itself. You worry about it being on the white, which is why, again, in a lot of egg preparations, the, the white is the cooked part and the, and the yolk is either like runny or it's completely raw. Um, so yeah, I mean, look, don't do it because I'm telling you because I'm not telling you to do it. But I will say that, you know, it doesn't seem to be like actually a big problem in people that eat the whole egg uh, raw. Um, and I think raw egg yolks is how you want to do it, you know, because uh, I think um, when you cook, I think when you cook them, you lose a pretty decent amount of the nutrient content um, and you're creating something called uh, oxysterols, which is like a cooking by byproduct of the cholesterol in the eggs. Um, so yeah, I would try not to do that. And they're also like relatively PUFA rich. So you also risk oxidizing the, the polyunsaturated fats if you're going to cook the, cook the yolks. So yeah, I mean, optimally, in my opinion, you would cook the whites and then eat the yolks raw. So like sunny side up. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't think if you wanted to do them raw, both raw, that you would have a problem. And then the second part of the question is, should I worry about the acidity of orange juice for my teeth? So um, this is like a whole topic about dental health, but uh, what I will say is that yes, acidity in the mouth does seem to promote like cavities. Um, and the, but that acidity is really promoted by like bacterial overgrowths in the mouth, which is why, you know, we're supposed to brush our teeth because it like eliminates some of the bacteria and that's what mouthwash does, etc. cetera. Um, so like the acute acidity of having orange juice in your mouth, I, I don't think that's gonna promote cavities. I think the problem with cavities is that when you have a prolonged exposure to high levels of acidity, um, and that is the result of a bacterial overgrowth in the mouth, which typically originates in the intestine. Um, I think there are some stories of like people taking antibiotics um, or even laxatives to like rid their intestines of a lot of bacteria and then their dental health like dramatically improves. Um, and then the other thing I'll say about the dental health is that the bat soluble vitamins are incredibly important. Uh, so A, D, K2 are going to be really crucial. Uh, for maintaining dental health. And that's something that Weston A. Price figured out like a hundred years ago. <laughs> okay, my guy, Coach Coach Frizzo, again, another uh, supporter of the show, not the show, the uh, <laughs> the channel, uh, great guy. And he's got a lot of good content. Guys ripped out of his mind. Uh, so go check him out, Coach Frizzo Beast Mode on Twitter. Uh, he goes, how much uh, should your ancestry play a role in your diet? Should I eat differently than someone from Africa or Indonesia? Curious to hear what you think. So um, I <laughs> I honestly wouldn't like base anything off of a speculative approach that's like, I probably should be doing this because they might've been eating this. I think it's completely different if you get something like 23andMe or you get a genetic test that says like, oh, like I have a polymorphism in MTHFR. 
maybe because of my ancestry and that means that I should probably be eating more glycine. Yeah, I think, and maybe I should be getting more riboflavin. I think targeted approaches like that are totally reasonable and I would actually encourage that, but I don't think that the speculative nature of like, oh, well, like, you know, my mom's from South America, so like I should probably just be eating papayas. <laughs> like, um, you know, I think the human body differs from person to person genetic wise and ancestry wise, but it doesn't change that much. So uh, that would probably be my, my answer for that. Yeah, I'd agree. All right, let's do. All right, Isaacs, you want to do? Oh yeah, we could do Isaacs. Isaacs is another, uh, another big supporter of uh, of the videos. So yeah, I think he put in two questions, but let me see. I mean, we're only gonna have time to answer one of them, unfortunately. Actually, he gave us like eight questions. And I said, I'm sorry, bro, but, uh, oh wait, I'm sorry. Okay, actually, yeah, we can do this and then let's, let's do the Patreon question after. Um, <laughs> he goes, if I'm full of seed oils, presumably he means polyunsaturated fats in his tissues or from years of eating them, relatively fat and somewhat fatigued in mind and body, what are the steps I should take right now to maximize metabolism and health in a healthy, sustainable way? answer like I'm a dummy so that I and everyone can understand, please. Um, I wish it was that simple <laughs> to be able to explain it all like a dummy and everyone just, you know, be able to understand it. But it does require some level of understanding the mechanisms that are at play uh, in order to really do this. So, I mean, this is a very general question, but I would, you know, the full of seed oils thing, I would, you know, if you're trying to boost the metabolism, I would probably take the approach that we discussed earlier, which is like the lower fat vitamin E longer chain fatty acids, uh, longer chain saturated fatty acids. If you are going to eat some fat, um, that would be the best thing to slowly get rid of the seed oils while also trying to, on the other hand, uh, maximize the metabolism, uh, by burning carbohydrate. Uh, and then, you know, there are a lot of simple, very effective, uh, interventions like caffeine and like taking thyroid hormone that, you know, are pretty much always going to pick up your energy and help you lose fat uh, regardless of your diet okay uh so jeff from patreon sorry that we kept you waiting so long jeff <laughs> but uh he says how about uh what would you recommend to someone who you believe to be having a candida overgrowth hear good things about uh these different probiotics uh would you recommend these or other supplements what about diet changes thanks so uh but a lot of people believe they have candida but don't this is actually a pretty funny thing so i think candida overgrowth is like pretty uh pretty overblown i'm not saying that some people don't have it but like an actual systemic fungal issue is like incredibly dangerous and like not many people actually have it so if you think that you have candida please get a stool test if possible you know to confirm it like if you actually do have it because a lot of times you know if you don't you know you can question the validity of the tests but um, yeah, a lot of the times people might be mistaking candida for a bacterial problem or potentially like another parasite. So, I, you know, if you can get the stool test, if you want to spend some money on that, I think that's definitely the first thing I would do. I don't think probiotics is going to be, uh, your best bet. You know, there might be studies that show that they have some benefit, but I don't think they're really attacking the problem. And the problem with, you know, we'll just call it like general bacterial or fungal overgrowth problems. It's typically a dysfunctional immune system. Um, and a lack of proper energy metabolism, which is keeping you from, again, moving multiple times a day and constantly like emptying out uh, the colon of, of, you know, potential bacterial overgrowth. So um, yeah, those are the things that I would focus on. So for that, coffee is obviously good at making you poop. Um, thyroid is gonna be important for that. Uh, other things, the, uh, maybe some like insoluble fibers like carrot or uh, bamboo shoots or something like that. Uh, and then if it actually is candida, the most effective thing that I know of is the flowers of sulfur. So you can just take like a pinch of that for a couple of days orally, and that should clean up uh, any fungal overgrowths. Um, dietary changes, I would, again, I would, you know, probably just stick with the same pro-metabolic approach that's supporting the immune system, because a lot of people will say, you know, if you have candida, you got to cut out all the sugar, but that actually tends to make the problem a lot worse because estrogen tends to promote candida overgrowth um and estrogen can definitely be elevated from restricting carbohydrates um and then you have like the 
the fact that the thyroid plays such a massive role in the immune system as does the body temperature in general. When you have a lower body temperature and a lower thyroid metabolism, you are more susceptible to these fungal overgrowths, bacterial overgrowths, whatever. So I would really take that approach of trying to optimize uh, both the metabolism and the immune system uh, in addition to, you know, keep moving. <laughs> Carrot salad too, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I think I mentioned that. Totally. All right, let's do a Shane's question. So another, another well, he big also, support. Jeff Sorry. also asked about the um, the probiotics. I'm going to just go over that real quick. Yeah, I mean, I, I said like, you know, uh, I don't think that, I, I, I wouldn't be taking probiotics. I don't know if they even ha are going to have an impact. And if they do, it's probably going to be minor. You're not going to totally eliminate the problem just by taking probiotics. So you could try them, but I wouldn't expect too much from them. Um, Okay, so let's do, yeah, Shane at Scary Biscuits. This is another one of my guys. He's a big, big fan of the videos, big fan of the content. So shout out to Shane. Uh, he says, are dietary isoflavones of hormonal concern? And if so, should, for example, unfermented soybeans, et cetera, be uh, avoided? So we're talking about soy boys now. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, overconsumption. So th this is actually a, a little gripe that I have uh, with the evidence-based community is that they'll pull up the studies that uh you know might feed more soy or isoflavones or you know phytoestrogens to people and they put all the studies together and they say look there's no difference in the testosterone level but so it's like yeah so that proves that the soy doesn't have like a feminizing effect meanwhile if you feed the shit to a fish it literally can change its gender <laughs> um that's how estrogenic these things can be so the the argument is not that they lower testosterone the argument is that they have independent estrogenic effects on the cell and on the different uh, estrogen receptors so yes they, they are definitely estrogenic and anyone trying to say that they're not probably doesn't know a lot of what they're talking about because it's not it's not controversial they're literally called phytoestrogens for a reason it's not because they're not estrogenic because they don't have effect on this one blood blood marker which is your serum testosterone um but at the, at the same time you know i don't think you have to be super anal about it you know I just wouldn't try to base a diet primarily on beyond meat and tofu <laughs> for a lot of reasons, but you know, the soy is, you know, I, I think it's suboptimal, but at the same time, like I'm not, you know, I'm not super dogmatic about it. Like, you know, if you want to have some tofu or some other types of soy products from time to time, like, I don't think that's a massive deal. I just don't know why you would. <laughs> it's not like it's really good. I mean, like yeah, like I, <laughs> It doesn't like you, taste good. It doesn't like, and you, I, I don't know. I just, I, I don't really see the appeal. Like you could say something like that's like peanut butter. It's like, you know, it's probably not the best, but you know, there's nothing, you can't really get something that tastes like peanut butter. Like it's, it's just so good that like, I, I would say that something like maybe yeah. something like that. It'd be like, you know, yeah, have it once in a while, but like, you know, tofu, like what are you really getting out of that? Are you getting <laughs> any quality of life increase from eating that? So yeah, and I don't, that's actually a good point. I don't know how uh, estrogenic, like how many of these uh, compounds are in the uh, in in beans like that besides soy, but yeah, no, I I totally agree with that. Um, and then the other, sorry, I, I should probably mention this, but yeah, just just monitor your symptoms. So one of the big things about these estrogenic compounds is that they're digestive enzyme inhibitors. Um, so in nature, this is a way that the plant gets you to stop eating it. It's like a plant toxin. Um, so yeah, it's, it inhibits, uh, all, pretty much all of the, uh, enzymes that break down proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. So, you know, if you're having digestive distress and take out the things that are not allowing you to digest, and if you're having low libido, you're not make, waking up with morning wood or any of these other things that are, you know, possibly estrogenic, <clears throat> if you have like love handles or whatever. Um, yeah, then probably don't eat, don't eat the soy. <laughs> don't eat the bugs. Don't eat the soy. <laughs> You want to do um, um, city so, Sudi Jumi next? Uh, sure. I think that's a good question. Okay. Yeah, this goes right, right along with it. Would you say the decline of male testosterone is due to the modern standard American diet, malnutrition, or due to plastics and such? The Try Guys did a testosterone check and they were pitiful, lower than the average elderly man. Seems like blaming it all on microplastics is such a <laughs> foil hat theory when so many people nowadays eat an inadequate diet. Um, so yeah, I would say, you know, blaming all microplastics is 
uh, misguided. I don't know about tinfoil hot, but I would say, because, you know, they do have estrogenic effects. Um, but I think it's both. I mean, I think it's that and it's a lot of other things. You know, I think that, you know, not having a purpose or not feeling like you are like the man that definitely lowers testosterone. Guys being on SSRIs, that definitely lowers testosterone. Guys eating soy doesn't lower testosterone, but it does have estrogenic effects. Um, and then, you know, people having bacterial overgrowth that promotes serotonin that lowers testosterone. People are eating a lot of polyunsaturated fats instead of saturated fats that affects testosterone. The plastics are a big thing. You know, there's so many things in our modern environment and culturally, you know, we're not as men, like we are not supposed to be like alpha men. And I hate that. I hate that like moniker, but like, you know, you're not supposed to say what you want to say. You're not supposed to do what you want to do. If you have a boss, you feel like you're second fiddle or whatever the case may be. And those things actually do have an impact on your testosterone. Also, I think porn is a big problem. You know, if you're busting nuts all the time, you're not gonna have as high a level of testosterone. Um, you know, I think if it's with a female, then that's different because that's like, yeah, you're getting rid of like the test or whatever. You might have like a lowering of test because you're, you know, ejaculating, but at the same time, you have the connection with a female and the sense of accomplishment which actually gives you a boost of testosterone. So it's different if it's with a female, but if you're just you know, masturbating a bunch, then you know that's also gonna affect testosterone. And Lord knows that guys are probably getting with less, less girls and probably masturbating more than ever now. So I think it's, you know, it's a hundred different factors that, you know, have led to the testosterone decrease epidemic. Yeah, I mean, like back in the day, think about it. Like, let's say like in the fifties or something, like you were a man and like you had to go, you had such a purpose to like provide for your family. Like you had to go out and provide and you had to, you had to go out and work. Maybe you were going to fight in a war. You probably weren't getting these, you know, microplastics or phytoestrogenic materials or xenoestrogens. Um, whether, you know, the, it was just, everything was, was so much different back then. You couldn't just go like, look at your phone and like beat off all the time um and i think there's so there yeah there's like dalton said there's just so many different factors that that could play into this um yeah, and I, I, diet diet is one but i feel like yeah i feel like jack you could speak on the, the cultural aspect of like because you know testosterone gets boosted when you have a sense of accomplishment you have a sense of purpose you feel like you are the so to speak alpha male like you feel like you are accomplishing things um, so, I mean, you could definitely speak on the cultural aspect of why tea is definitely low. Yeah. I mean, I mean, kind of just like, I guess what I, what I, what I said, like, just like, I, I think that the destruction of the family unit is probably just inherently, I think that's probably very bad for it, for testosterone levels. And really, I think, I think that the, the biggest thing would be kind of the sense of purpose. Like what you, what do you really do every day? Like are you go kind of going to work to, to provide or are you just kind of working a menial job that you hate and you have to, you know, sit, you're sitting down all day kind of doing nothing. I would say that's a huge factor. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, so why don't we take one more? Let's pick a good one. Um, so the, the, I'm sorry, monkers, but the question about sugar, um, that's kind of covered in the Lustig video, so I don't want to, you know, belabor that and go into depth here. I mean, we could just answer um, them quickly, like uh, Dean, you see Dean Kirkgarl, Connor, Connor Jealous. We could just answer that one quick, I think. Hold on. Dean? Oh, okay. How do you take thyroid? Uh, th this one you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. How do you take thyroid, for example, do you do a drop of tyranine twice a day under your tongue, or do you mix it in a drink? So... Uh, I take, and I don't take it too often. I just feel like uh, I'll take it like when I feel like I need to. Um, but I, I do a Sinomel, which is the tablet form of it. And that's like way easier. You can measure it out. Uh, the thing with thyroid is that you don't want to take too much at once. So unless you're taking it with a meal, you want to keep it to like under five micrograms you know, in a dose and then spread that, you know, don't take it super often. So like, you know, if you're going to be like fully like on the thyroid replacement bandwagon, you should be. I would ideally like every two hours you would take like two to three micrograms of T3. Um, in terms of tyronine, which if anyone doesn't know is ideal lab supplement for thyroid, um, you would not want to do like one drop of that because that's eight micrograms <laughs> and that's way too much in one sitting unless you're having it with a meal. So what I used to do uh, when I did it would I would take a, like a water bottle. I know plastic kind of sucks, but like kind of all that I had to work with. 
I would put a drop in and then I would like shake it up because it doesn't dissolve super well. And then I would take like a fourth of that, just like kind of eyeball it. So that would be like a, around two micrograms. Um, so that would be my approach. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I take tyronine. Uh, I like that it's in a liquid. Uh, what I usually do is I'll, I'll put it in like a cup or something. Cause I'm usually not out of the house for, you know, extended periods of time. Um, so I always just have like a cup on my kitchen, on my kitchen counter. And usually I'll, I'll have a third of a drop with each dose, usually like every few hours, if I feel like I need it, like usually when I'm gonna eat, I'll have like a little bit. It's kind of like, I just do it by feeling really, like what do I feel? Um, but it also is, I would say like, you know, doing it in liquid, I, I would say if you're not really like thinking about it that much, it w wouldn't be the best way to do it. Um, because I've, I've had times where I thought there was like only one drop in it, but I had actually put more into it. So I drank too much and I would think that I've had two experiences where I took too much thyroid and I just got like crazy anxiety. I just felt like horrible. It was like, it, it was like a, like kind of like a bad trip kind of thing. It's just not. Yeah. Take, yeah. Taking too much thyroid can send you down a really bad rabbit hole. Like that's why I'm very adamant about taking it in small doses, like infrequently. Yeah. And I didn't even realize I was doing it. I was in the car. I had to go to some job and I was in, I was in the car and I was just like, like bugging out like i just started like bugging out when i was driving and i didn't really know what it was and then i put it together that i drank too much thyroid yeah right. um you want to do teflon pans next uh i wanted to answer brad cone this right. one like we could do pretty quick and another avid supporter big fan so shout out to brad um says what's the least expensive nutritionally complete subsistence diet so honestly i don't think this has to be any of this stuff that we talk about has to be expensive you can get ground beef drain the fat pretty inexpensively. You can get a, a dozen eggs, that's pretty inexpensive. You can get milk, like really cheap. Uh, coffee is cheap, you know, white sugar, if you wanna go that route, which not everyone should, but some people, you know, if you wanna do that, then that's really cheap. A lot of this stuff can be cheap. It's just about, you know, what what your budget's like and, and the sourcing. Um, another thing that I'll say is like, if in terms of meat, one thing that's pretty economical is buying like a roast. Uh, it's like six or seven pounds and you can just put that in the oven it's really fast easy and that can give you you know that can give you food for like a week or more and that'll cost you like whatever 50 bucks um obviously that you don't want that to be the only thing in your diet <laughs> but um yeah it's like a, obviously a really good start yeah. and then even in even shellfish uh i don't think oysters are super expensive i don't think shrimp is super expensive and the, the number one thing is that the organ meats are the least expensive part of the animal, even though they're by far the most nutritious. So organ meats definitely is going to be a big thing. Yeah, I'd agree hundred percent. Okay. Yeah. So Liam Jean says, what do you think of Teflon pans and possibly other problematic kitchen supplies? So I would definitely <laughs> stay away from Teflon. I think that's high in uh, fluoride, uh, which is not good. <laughs> Um, and then uh, you have other things. So uh, we actually used to use cast irons, but I don't think that's optimal, honestly. And I do still use it, but I'm you know fortunate enough to still be young where my body doesn't accumulate a ton of iron. Um, but I think in the long run, you would not want to be cooking out of iron either because of these, you know, I, iron accumulation is pretty ubiquitous in most diseases um, and in terms of just like feeling like shit. So, you know, I would try not to cook out of iron if possible, although that's definitely better than Teflon in my opinion. I think your best, the absolute best would be to do uh, like ceramic, but I don't know what the budget's like or, or what the accessibility is like, but I think that that is pretty much close to zero risk. Yeah, I know, I know the girls that used to make these Teflon, that used to like work in these factories or it was, they would work in the factories or um, they would they would have kids with terrible birth defects. They would have a lot of side effects um, there's a good documentary about it on Netflix. I forget what it's called, but I would definitely recommend watching it. And, you know, it destroys the environment. It, it can't, this Teflon can't be good. And I would say anything's better than a non, anything's better than a non-stick pan. They also have stainless steel, but I've heard that that yeah. gets rid of yeah, a lot I of, think that's like a lot of, that could be like a lot of nickel though. And like chromium, I think. So that's probably not good either. Um, it's, it's tough to find, uh, a pan that's 100% good, I would say. Yeah. So is is there uh, other ones that you think we could do quickly? 
Or should um, I just get into the last one? Is cardio really just a meme? Does frequent running harm okay. more than help? I would say, yeah, it would probably would harm more than help, right? So in my, okay, so my opinion on this is, it depends what type of cardio. So I think I'm all pro walking and I'm generally pro uh, like high intensity interval, if you will, uh, like explosive movements. I'm definitely not a fan of like uh, marathons and uh, extended uh, aerobic exercises. Uh, definitely not a fan of that because it pretty much does everything that you don't want. It's a prolonged inflammation, it's a prolonged stress. It, completely unless you're you know stocking up on orange juice or you're doing sugar gels or whatnot like you're going to be burning a lot of fat um which you know might be good in some cases but i think it's just i think it's a definitely a stressor and then if you are carb depleted you're gonna have to strip down your muscle in order to produce the carbohydrates so you know if you look at you know the the marathon runners they eat a bunch of carbohydrates but they're all like very skinny and you could argue that you know oh well that's good for the sport but i would say go look at usain bolt this guy's jacked out of his mind and he runs faster than a freaking cheetah so and that's because his he isn't uh, presumably he doesn't do like a lot of uh and it's not just him it's all the sprinters they're built they're built like tanks and they run like the wind of course so um i think that's like a definitely a more optimal metabolic state than to be like sort of withering away running 20 plus miles at once um doing it okay but more harm than help i i think it really and this is like a general thing but i think like if you really love running i think that the enjoyment and like the satisfaction and you know potentially like fulfillment that you get from doing something that you love i think that that outweighs any like health risks in that situation um if it's like true enjoyment and it like you know sort of like <laughs> gives you like spiritual ful fulfillment or whatever you want to call it. I think that that is definitely a, a bigger benefit than uh, any harms physiologically that we could talk about. All right, cool. And you want to make the second last one, Pepino O2, and then uh, finish off with the croissant diet. Pepino O2. Pepino. Oh, okay, okay. The question is... Yeah, why don't you take this one? <laughs> the question is smoking pure tobacco versus pure weed without papers or filters versus vaping. Which one causes the most damage? I would say... I would say none of them cause, like, very inherent damage, I would say. Like, I don't think any of them really would, like, destroy your lungs or really make you explicitly unhealthy. But I would think that weed... Um, doesn't have a great effect on your hormones and for many different hormones like a lot to get into right now and i don't think it has a good effect on your brain at all i think it could really um i think if you have maybe like like a little psychotic tendencies like we could really bring that out and it has been shown to to cause psychosis in people with heavy use um i would say as far as weed like i mean maybe if you're, if you're doing it once in a while it's probably not the worst thing but i, I most people that smoke weed that I know don't do it once in a while and they do it every day. And I would think that that, I would think that that really like kind of kills your drive. I would say, you know, for some people it doesn't like, you can look at like Joe Rogan and he seems to do be, be doing really well, but I would say the average person weed is like not what you want to do. It makes you more docile, kind of like turns you into a beta male, I would say. Um, so I would say weed would probably be the worst out of them. And then I, I know like the smoking pure tobacco is kind of a meme now. Um, I mean, I've just to say like, I've been vaping um, for like eight years now, like every day, uh, nicotine. And I haven't seen any deleterious effects on my lungs or anything else. And it has been a while. Um, so I hope I'm not like in 10 years, like I'm not gonna die from it because we really don't know. We don't know how safe it is or not. But I would say from my experience, um, Vaping is not really harmed me at all. And I, I feel like it's, it's only benefited me just like as a nootropic. Um, yeah, I'm addicted to it, but I would say that it has more benefits than harms. Uh, well, I wouldn't recommend to do it, but just in my in my scenario. And when I do smoke cigarettes, I guess I, I kind of do get a cough, even though they're American spirits, but they are with filters and papers. So who knows if that's causing it. But, you know, when I am smoking a lot of American spirits, I would say that I 
do feel it in my lungs and I don't really, and I, I, I would definitely cough more um, when I'm, when I'm smoking either when I'm smoking tobacco. Yeah. So one thing that I will say is that this seems to be somehow seed oils come back into the conversation, but I think, um, I think this is one of those cases where like tobacco or many insults to uh, the lungs actually don't really cause damage in the absence of like a high seed oil diet because they make up your tissues and they make your tissues susceptible to damage. So it's the same thing with the liver and alcohol. Like that's why the saturated fats are employed as a treatment for, uh, for fatty liver disease and, and alcoholic liver damage because they protect against that damage that polyunsaturated fats make the liver susceptible to. So I think it's, I think that definitely plays a role. Um, but this is something I talked about on, on Dan Coe's podcast a little bit, but essentially pure tobacco even though it's classified as a carcinogen uh, and it's like the quintessential, like, you know, it definitely causes cancer. It's never been shown in an animal study to actually do that on its own, pure tobacco. Not, we're not talking papers. We're not talking filters. We're not talking radioactive waste that's sprayed on the tobacco. We're talking about pure tobacco has never been shown in animals. Like even if you expose them to hundreds of cigarettes, like equivalent, like if you scale it down for size, hundreds of cigarettes a day a lot sometimes the mice were or rats have even been protected from lung cancer so it's like an impossible stretch to say that tobacco is a carcinogen yeah i'm gonna say that because it's definitely not it's not an impossible stretch to say that any of this other crap that's in most cigarettes or otherwise is uh is a carcinogen because it probably is <laughs> um but yeah no tobacco on its own honestly like is has medicinal use and it's an aromatase inhibitor and it has anti-stress effects so you know i would suggest you know i'm always skeptical of like the the vaping stuff you know plastics and metals and, and whatnot but i think the best option if you want to do any of this stuff i'm also not an advocate of smoking weed um I think your best option would be like if you get like a ceramic pipe and smoke like organic tobacco, I think that is really not going to have any harm and possibly benefit as well. But again, we aren't really recommending that. No, yeah, not. No, <laughs> do not start smoking or vaping or anything because we're talking about this. No, this is a strictly academic conversation. <laughs> so, all right. So you, you want to do the last one now? All right. Yeah, you can take the last one. And this will be our last question. Uh, so take it away. Oh guys, so I've, I, I, I want to do a video on this, but it's kind of too niche to do a video. So I'll give my little spiel here. Um, so he asks, are you aware of the SCD1 gene theory of obesity and the work of Brian, his name is actually Brad, I think, Marshall with the croissant diet. So a lot to unpack here, but essentially uh, guys like Brad Marshall and Peter, uh, I can't pronounce his last name, but he has the site uh, called Hyperlipid. So Brad Marshall has a site called uh, Fire in a Bottle and Peter has a site called Hyperlipid. And they post a lot of really interesting content. I would definitely go check them out. Uh, but both of them essentially make the case that the saturated fats are unique, especially the long chain ones are unique in that they promote leanness. And that's definitely been shown in animals. But the mechanism that by which they do this is that they produce more reactive oxygen species in the adipose and that increased level of reactive oxygen species is able to cause insulin resistance in the cell itself, which in an adipose cell is actually a good thing because insulin causes the uptake of the fat into that cell. So if you are super insulin sensitive in the fat cell, again, I'm just, I don't know if any of this is for sure true, I'm just explaining the theory. Um, if your fat cells are super insulin sensitive, you're gonna be good at taking up a lot of fat, which is obviously not a good thing. Um, so the croissant diet is basically like, it, it was, is really cool. Uh, so basically the croissant diet is, uh, because they believe that the, the polyunsaturated fats promote obesity and the long chain saturated fats promote leanness. Uh, they basically, or Brad basically said, Hey, I did a diet of only croissants and butter. And I think he might've done like some uh, isolated stearic acid, which is one of the fatty acids that's in like cocoa butter and, and beef towel and butter. Um, but he basically only ate that and drank some red wine. So he was living like an extreme Frenchman for a while. I don't know if he had any cigarettes on top of that or some coffee, but 
uh yeah he 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 did that and he lost like 30 or 40 pounds and then some other people came along did it and did the same thing so you know i don't think um you know i i I definitely agree that the polyunsaturated fats probably promote obesity in most circumstances as well the longer chain saturated fats and probably the the short chain ones also promote leanness now with all that being said i do have some problems with the theory number one is that it's based on the idea that when you oxidize the fat in the fat cell, it produces these reaction, reactive oxygen species, which then prevents the uptake of the fat into the cell. So I've, right off the bat, my main problem is that fat cells mainly burn glucose, which produce, produces way less reactive oxygen species than even burning uh, PUFA. So right off the bat, that doesn't, that seems to be a problem. <laughs> because the fat cells mostly oxidize glucose. Um, they also, I think they can also oxidize fructose, which is the other part of sugar. Um, the second thing I would say is that in a lot of these studies, if they feed a high uh, polyunsaturated fat, like omega-6, you can actually add on some omega-3 and they will actually get leaner. So if it was all about the unsaturation of the fats, then we would expect that these animals get even fatter if they're, uh, you know, eating more omega-3 on top of that because you're just increasing the total amount of polyunsaturated load. So there seems to be uh, an effect, and I could hypothesize as to why, but there's definitely an effect of the omega-3 and omega-6 balance in the body and your tissues that may or may not promote leanness uh, or obesity, depending on which uh, way you tip the scale. The SCD1 theory is essentially that. So this is an enzyme called uh, steril coa desaturase basically it takes stearic acid which is a long chain saturated fat that is mainly abundant in cocoa in cocoa butter and in butter and in beef tallow it's an enzyme that converts it into a monounsaturated fat oleic acid which is the main fat in olive oil and the theory um, which is pretty well substantiated is that people that have more of this enzyme in their fat cells tend to be like it's actually a really strong correlation that they become more obese. And we're not even talking about polyunsaturated fats, we're talking about monounsaturated fats now. So that's really interesting. I unfortunately haven't gotten a ton of time to really dig into the mechanisms, but I will say, you know, in my own research, which I can't really give too much away until it's uh, until it's all said and done, but uh, I, in my experience in, in the lab, it seems like the longer chain saturated fats are better at promoting leanness than the monounsaturated fats are. Um, so that's really interesting. Um, yeah, I think, um, I think it's, I think it's awesome. All of it. You know, I think it's great because it's people talking and sharing ideas and, you know, Peter's a vet and Brad Marshall's a damn pig farmer and they're figuring all this stuff out and they're sharing it and people are sharing their stories. It's a great overall thing. I love it. You know, I, I support the whole thing. I just don't know if that's the end all be all mechanism. And, you know, maybe I just don't know enough about it because I haven't been like reading hyperlipid and fire in the bottle, like extremely uh, uh, closely recently. But those are the problems that I have with the theory. I'm not saying that it's not a contributing factor, but I don't know if that mechanism is the driver of obesity. All right, good answer. So that I was think, a mouthful, but <laughs> I think that'll yeah. about wrap up our analyze and optimize Q and A hope you guys enjoyed it um you know let us know if we should do something like this in the future um and we will definitely consider it um we mainly For did sure. this so we mainly did this because we have another video coming out that will take a very long time uh we're still doing the script and it's it's gonna be a, a long video it's gonna take a while to produce and we're still working on the script but the script is pretty much done we just gotta edit it so stay tuned and it'll be well worth the wait yeah stay tuned for um, that what would you say like three weeks or something maybe yeah i mean i yeah i think i think two or three weeks is uh is a pretty reasonable time frame yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna be pretty free to to be able to work on it and i'm obviously super excited to to get it out there i think people are really gonna enjoy it on a very good important topic with a lot of nuance and a lot of history behind it so definitely stay tuned for that this might end up being our longest video ever another thing that i would say is that um you know, if you liked what you heard on here, if you want to, you know, have your questions answered more specifically or in depth, you know, we do offer uh, chats on uh, Patreon where, you know, we'll take out some time and 
answer your questions much more in depth. We also, for a little bit higher price, we order uh, private Zoom meetings where we could talk about whatever. Um, and then, you know, if that's not really in your budget, you know, you could always hit us up on Twitter, on email, ask us questions. Um, but, you know, just be mindful that, you know, we do have to make a living too. So, you know, we can't uh, answer everything to the degree that we would want uh, with the time that we have uh, solely on those non-paying platforms, although we absolutely will answer uh, within reason. All right, so, cool. yeah, appreciate everyone listening. Hope you enjoyed and uh, don't let them fool you. Yeah, subscribe to our channel. See you later, guys.